Hi everyone, I'm Jody Dunn, editor of Food and Drink Magazine, and I'm here today with a couple of our editors to talk about all things Thanksgiving, specifically the market share menu in our autumn issue, where we present unique seasonal dishes that are brimming with the flavors of Thanksgiving and that utilize what's available right now in local farmers markets. We will of course touch on traditional favorites too, and talk about what to serve alongside them. And we'll also highlight some other recipes from the issue that we think are perfect for Thanksgiving. Before we get started, I'm going to have Eric introduce himself. Hi there, I'm Eric Fellon, the uh, food editor uh, for almost two years at Food and Drink, and I've been contributing to the magazine for close to seven. The Thanksgiving menu up for discussion was developed by Monda Rosenberg, one of our longtime contributors. Since Monda was unavailable this evening, I'm stepping in. And tonight, talking about drinks and pairings is our content editor, Victoria Walsh. Hi there, Victoria Walsh here. I'm a recipe developer, a food writer, and a drinks writer, um, and content editor for Food and Drink Magazine. Um, today, I'm going to share my tips for what to pair with your Thanksgiving dinner. All right, let's get started. So on screen now, I think you'll see our autumn issue, which came out in the first part of September. So if you missed a copy, uh, you can find a digital issue online at lcbo.com. And this uh, cover, a beautiful moody autumnal cover, features a garlic tart, which Eric, this is from a feature you did in the issue. So do you want to talk a little bit about our cover image? Yeah, this is from a story I did sort of featuring Ontario garlic because it comes, you know, in fall, it's that perfect and it really works well a lot of fall dishes. That, that specific dish on the cover is a uh, puff pastry tart, caramelized onions and roasted squash. And then the garlic comes in, I make a confit, which is, means garlic cloves are simmered in a very low heat in oil. And not only do you get these soft, sweet garlic cloves, you get the, the oil that you brush onto the tart as well and it's garnished with a few uh, pumpkin seeds. It's, it's a wonderful dish. Right, and this is a great looking dish too for the cover, but also in this uh, in this story, you share the secrets to the perfect garlic bread. So I guess you'll have to either pick up an issue or go online to find out all the secrets to make your perfect garlic bread. Okay, so moving along, we're gonna start our Thanksgiving feast with a welcome cocktail. So Victoria, you developed a very locally inspired drink. So do you wanna share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I figure Thanksgiving is a celebration. So why not go with a bubbly cocktail? Uh, kick off the feast with this twist on a French 75 that is all locally focused. I find the French 75 is always a hit at dinner parties. Local vores will love this recipe too, because it's a great chance to show off some homegrown ingredients. Um, maybe you picked up a wildflower honey at your farm, local farmer's market. You can incorporate that or craft gin um, like Jordan Bay or Spirit of York that we have here um, and a sparkling wine. We've, we're also um, using Trias, but you can use whatever you've got on hand, a sweet or a dry uh, sparkling wine will work well in this cocktail. It's also a super easy cocktail. Honestly, the hardest part is mixing the honey syrup with some water, um, and that's all you're doing. A little warm water, and you've got your syrup ready to go. If you want to make things even easier, I have a recipe on lcbo.com where you can skip the shaker altogether and just chill a mixture in the fridge with a little bit of water, and it replicates perfectly um, chilling your cocktail by shaking it, and you have, you've skipped that step altogether. Right. It's always great to have a shortcut, uh, no matter what you're doing. So uh, that cocktail features gin and not everyone's a gin lover. So also in the autumn issue, Victoria, you did another story uh, where you talk about spicy cocktails. Um, and one of, I think, your favorites from there was this horseradish martini, which uh, you can use either gin or vodka. So do you want to talk a little bit about that cocktail and that story? For sure. Um, so that story I, I really enjoyed making. It's a, a spicy cocktail story um, that has a fiery kick, like in a way that you might not think. So these are not all made out of like eye watering, mouth burning peppers, although there's one of those, which is with pumpkin and it's excellent. Um, each has a warming ingredient like cinnamon, peppercorns, ginger, and then horseradish, like we were just talking about. And if you're willing to put in a little bit of extra effort to make this delicious cocktail, um, it's an unforgettable welcome cocktail. It's a twist on the Gibson, which is a timeless classic, but the horseradish gives it that like wasabi in the nose spice. 
Um, and it's all thanks to using freshly grated horseradish. That's the key aspect here. Um, it's a more savory cocktail. So it's super fr food friendly. You could have it with your roast beef dinner. Um, it, it's really flexible that way. And if you have any leftover horseradish infusion, um, it's killer in a Caesar or a Bloody Mary. Mm, Caesars who doesn't love a Caesar and for sure um you know like that image that looks fantastic so be sure to take your time with the garnishes because uh makes such a visual impact when your guests arrive and certainly makes them feel special that you've spent the time to make such a beautiful drink for them so now that we've ever, uh, everybody's had their welcome cocktail it's time to sit down to dinner and we're going to start with this smoked trout salad so Eric do you want to talk a little bit about that recipe yeah, this is a nice simple salad of hot smoked trout and greens in an autumnal vinaigrette of olive oil, cider vinegar, Dijon honey, sort of sweet and sour, and then cut that cider, gives it the fall feeling. Red onion uh, brings that sharpness of alliums that's really great in salads, especially with smoked fish and their capers are salty and sour and have a bit of umami. You could, for convenience, you could use packaged greens here, but if you want to do a more of a elegant fall mix, use a blend of radicchio, Belgian endive, and baby kale. The, the key trick in this recipe, and not many, because um, it's pretty easy, uh, is to let the onions sit in the dressing, the vinegar, and it lightly pickles the onions, and it sort of softens their bite. And as for the fish, locally farmed rainbow trout is a sustainable seafood choice, and it's increasingly easy to find, both smoked and raw, at many, many supermarkets. And you can find it at any fishmonger as well. So Eric, just talk a little bit about smoked trout. Like it's a pretty mild tasting fish, right? So it's a try it, you'll like it kind of fish. Yeah, it's, it's as for uh, smoked fish, smoked fish is all quite, quite strong, but as, as smoked fish goes, it's on the mild side. It's because it's not as oily as something like mackerel or salmon, which would be equally delicious in this salad if you can't find it. And be honest with you, you could even use, uh, use like sort of lox style smoked salmon in this salad as well. It'd be, it'd be fantastic. Great. And Victoria, what would you serve with this salad? Well, when you're looking for a match for the salad and most fall salads in general, it's hard to go wrong with a sparkling brute. Cave Springs Blanc de Blanc is an excellent choice. It's crisp with apple citrusy flavors and it has a palate cleansing minerality. It's refreshing and the bubbles and acidity make it a seamless match for the fish in this dish. If you like bubbly like I do, keep in mind, it's a great option that can span the whole meal. So it can be excellent with main courses, even dessert. If you're going to serve it with dessert, I would even lean to a bubbly that's a little bit on the sweeter side. Great. And what I love about these matches for all these recipes is that along with the locally sourced ingredients, all these products are local as well. Okay, so moving on to the soup course. Eric, we've got a roasted squash and parsnip soup. Yeah, this soup uh, is about as easy as it gets. All you do is roast squash and parsnips and you whiz them in a blender or a food processor with chicken stock in a little bit of time. You don't even actually have to make a pot. You just heat it. The pot is to reheat it. Um, what takes this dish from simple to spectacular are these little toasts of sharp blue cheese mashed with butter. The butter sort of helps it melt better and um, the garnish brings that crunchy texture to play the foil to the smooth soup. And that sharp pecan cheese is perfect with parsnips, which also have sort of an aggressive flavor. Now, to make adjustments for various diets, you can make the soup vegetarian just using vegetable stock instead of chicken. Um, to make it vegan, you could garnish it with plain croutons, like little diced ones, or spiced pumpkin seeds. Either of these options would bring that crunchy texture for balance. And don't worry if blue cheese isn't your thing, which a lot of people find it a bit strong. Um, something like Gruyere or even Parmesan would be excellent uh, on these croutons. And as with most soups, it's, it's great for Thanksgiving. Uh, as with any puree soups, make them a few days ahead, put it in the fridge or make it a month ahead and pop in the freezer. And that way, when it comes to the, the big meal, you don't have to worry about little things like that. Right, and a squash and parsnip soup, that again is a really, a pretty crowd pleasing flavor. Like I don't think you'll find anyone who would turn their nose up at that. But uh, if you're looking for a different soup, our archives at uh, lcbo.com are full of soup recipes to suit every flavor. Um, so Victoria, what would you serve with this soup in particular? 
Yeah, for fall soups, I think beer is a great pairing. Um, the sweet and earthy flavors in this soup call for something rich, malty, uh, with hoppy and smoky flavors that are found in the Neustadt brown ale here. Keep something in mind that brown ale um, can really carry through for the whole meal. It's just like the bubbly. So if you're a beer fan, you can rely on a brown ale. Uh, it works well with turkey. Uh, if you're not a poultry fan, pair it with roast beef dinner or even a sweetly glazed, glazed pork. Great, thanks Victoria. So moving along to the main course, we've got something a little bit unconventional here, Eric, a turkey market tagine. Yeah, this is actually a great dish for Thanksgiving because you're taking turkey, which is traditional, and all the sides and kind of it's all one dish. Uh, so this dish takes turkey breast and cuts into chunks, adds root vegetables, pears and olives and all braised in a broth with cumin and paprika, cinnamon and saffron. The aroma, I don't know if you've ever cooked a tagine before, but when you one of these cooking in your house that it just smells absolutely wonderful and traditional tagines tend to use dry fruit in this case Mondo went with something fresh and local like a pear and that brings that same hint of sweetness you get from the fruit which is a sort of a hallmark of the tagine broth um you know and what's great about this dish is that you know a lot of people finding roasting a whole bird intimidating it takes up your oven for hours it takes up your fridge for days that way it's a lot more compact and, and it takes the intimidation factor out of, of roasting a whole bird. Um, to serve with this, I would definitely go with couscous. It's a traditional condiment. It really soaks up that broth and all the flavor and it, it's really ready in, an, in a few minutes. You just pour hot water over it, cover it and it's done, um, which is definitely a lot easier than making mashed potatoes. Right, and maybe a great loaf of bread or a bun from your favorite local bakery alongside just really rounds it out nicely. So, Victoria, what would you serve with this deliciously fragrant tagine? So, as you know, Jody, hear us out, right? We, we paired this with a rosé, and we think rosé is not just for summer. A favorite of mine is this Taz Sketches of Niagara. It's vibrant red fruit, melon, floral notes, allow the exotic and savory elements in the tagine to really shine. Serve it chilled. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret with rosé. I like to stick it in the freezer for a few minutes before dinner. But for me, it's like nuts. You've got to set a timer or else it's just going to go into some kind of rosé territory um, or exploding territory like I do with toasting nuts where I always burn them. Um, another tip I would say to keep in mind for rosé is it's super food friendly, so you can serve it for the whole meal. It's a great choice for a classic uh, roast tur turkey dinner. And a great way to extend summer too. have a little taste of rosé. Um, so Victor, this seems like a good time to mention too, on uh, lcbo.com, you put together a Thanksgiving pairing guide that is really more geared towards traditional dishes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? For sure. Um, on lcbo.com, we're sharing some serving suggestions um, that are really geared to the traditional ones that you might be making, and they're paired with tried and true sippers. So you can just hop on um, into the food and drink section. And the bonus there is that you're just a few clicks away from shopping for your whole menu, and you can just check it off the list. Um, you'll also find there my tried and true two picks for Thanksgiving dinner, the classic roast dinner with all the fixins, uh, Pinot Noir and Riesling. Two bottles I'd recommend that are actually a part of the market uh, Thanksgiving story are Leaning Post's Pinot Noir. It's got those classically earthy berry notes and a bright acidity that make it a perfect match for turkey dinner. Also, it's hard to go wrong with a Riesling. This Charles Baker is a superb example. It's zesty, fruit forward, and it has a touch of sweetness. It's a go-to for a classic Thanksgiving spread. Great, great tips. Thanks, Victoria. Um, so we know not everyone is hosting a big crowd this year either. So also in the autumn issue, uh, we went to three winery chefs and had them give us their roast chicken recipe. So Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about that story um, and how that could work for Thanksgiving too? Yeah, this is a great story from another contributor, Amy Rosen, uh, three of a kind. And she asked three Niagara Bay chefs on how they would approach roasting chicken. And each chef brought completely different flavors and techniques to their recipes and it was a really fun feature. Uh, the one you see here is by Christina Mast, who slathers her bird in a lemony butter, and she roasts it on a bed of fennel and potatoes and shots. So you also get a protein in a side in one dish, which uh, I love. And thinking of chicken as, as a Thanksgiving, I mean, that's something I do. 
And last year I did a recipe, which I loved, is you butterfly chickens, two chickens, and put them on a sheet pan on top of stuffing. So they're kind of unstuffed. I guess you call it dressing. And that way the chicken juices drip into the stuffing and you get traditional stuffing and chicken on top. Uh, I love, and, and my gatherings are rarely more into roasting a whole turkey. So that's the kind of thing I do for, for Thanksgiving. Good. And those roast chickens too, like you've been enough for Thanksgiving, um, perfect Sunday dinners in the fall for sure. Right through totally. the fall. Yeah. Um, okay. So those are the main course. So now we're moving on to dessert. And uh, what we're proposing here is a carrot cake inspired pumpkin loaf. The uh, final course of Monda's menu is a moist loaf cake of apple and carrots. And it's enriched with butter and flavored with warm baking spices. Her icing brings together two of my favorite things, cream cheese frosting and pumpkin spice. And there's a final garnish you see on top of apple chips. It sort of keeps with the fall theme. It adds a different texture. And they're super easy to find these days. They're, they're available at most uh, in the natural food section of supermarkets or any natural food store um, in the snack section. You could totally find it. Um, the advantage of loaf cakes, um, they're generally more forgiving to decorate and serve than round cakes. And the uniced cake can be made up to about a month in advance. Double wrap it in saran wrap and put it in a freezer bag. And that will keep it super fresh, moist, no freezer burn yeah, up for up to a month. And that will help you get ready for Thanksgiving well ahead of time. And you can also serve for this cake with a dollop of pumpkin spice whipped cream or any of the pumpkin pie ice creams that are released this time of year. There are so many companies do it. Uh, Gelato Fresco is my personal favorite, but there, there are many options at this time of year. Right, and Mon is kind of famous. Uh, for her carrot cakes. She did a story way back in, I think it was 2013. Um, she did a whole story of carrot cakes and they're all available online too. But I know that anytime we post them in our social media feeds, uh, they certainly do very well. I think one of them, the Hawaiian carrot cake is probably our most liked post ever. So if you're looking for something a bit more ambitious, those are definitely worth seeking out because they're all delicious. Uh, so Victoria, back to this carrot cake, what would you serve with this one? Well, I totally agree about Monda's carrot cakes. Um, she gave me my start in the industry and I've tested so many of her carrot cakes. So I've got a lot of, a lot of thoughts for this one. And it makes me think about pairing in general um, when we talk about pairing with dessert. And I just want to share a couple tips that I have about pairing in general. So when it comes to pairing with dessert and all dishes, you really don't need to be exact. I like to run with this idea that Drinks work well with food when they have something in common. So light courses usually work with something crisp and refreshing, and it's hard to go wrong when your dessert and your drink end on a sweet note for the evening. So here I say double down on that sweet factor. You can do that with this delightful combination of ice wine and fine barrel aged brandy. It's a great compliment for the cake. So we've talked an awful lot about carrot cake here. Clearly we're all fans, but not everyone is. So I hear. So in this issue as well, uh, Eric, we've got this delicious sticky banana pudding with a whiskey toffee sauce. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? This, yeah, this is a wonderful dish. Uh, it was developed by Michelle Lucas Larving and it takes classy sticky toffee pudding. And instead of using dried fruit, she uses fresh bananas and she uses it in two ways. She'll mash super ripe bananas in the batter and then she'll, banana halves on top to garnish, gives it more of a wow factor when you bring dessert to the table. The sauce has rye whiskey in it, which isn't used in cooking very often. However, it has this sort of distinct spiciness that works well with this dish. And also in the sauce is honey, which gives it sort of a floral, floral complexity. And there's salt, the most important part, which in any caramel sauce uh, or any dessert sauce for that matter, it really makes the flavors pop. Um, if you don't have rye, uh, bourbon or scotch would work very well here, but I would definitely avoid if you have something like Lafroy or heavily peated scotch, don't use that because it has a very strong, strong smoky flavor that will completely bully the entire dish. Right, and uh, the sauce on its own, uh, if that's all you want to make, that's delicious, just poured over ice cream. Totally. Or a super simple dessert. Um, so not everyone is into dessert and a lot of people, um, are starting to serve cheese courses to round out a meal. So we developed this nippy cheddar coins to serve alongside a cheese board, or uh, they can go before dinner, or they're also a great idea to pack up and give to guests as a thank you for coming. So Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about this recipe? 
yeah, these this is the, like you said, it's got a triple function for a, a, a cracker. Um, and having it as as we've presented it to give as a parting gift, really, it's like the cherry on top of a wonderful experience. And people take that home and they all and they eat it the next day and they'll recall what a what a nice meal they had the night before. And um, they're basically savory shortbreads and they're like ice box cookies. So you make logs of dough ahead of time, put them in the fridge or freezer, and then just cut and bake them off whenever you feel like it. Though in my experience, shortbreads have this uncanny way of improving a few days after they bake. I don't know what it is. The flavor, both the taver, flavor and texture seem to get a little bit better. So bake them off, you know, up to a week ahead even, just put them in a, in a, in a you know, sort of airtight container at room temperature, and then they're ready to go. Um, also, I would, this is a great recipe to have up your sleeve during the holidays as well, um, both as serving as a snack or as a, a savory kind of Christmas gift. You'd, if you're just giving little gifts to your neighbors or something like that, uh, it'd be well, well, well received. Yeah, pretty universal flavor. Cheese, cheese cookie, you can't go wrong. So Victoria, do you want to talk a little bit, if you were going to make these um, uh, these cheese cookies, what would you put on a cheese board? What are maybe some of your favorite cheese and, and pairings to serve alongside? Sure. Um, <clears throat> for these savory cookies, I'd say go with Malvor's Gamay. When it's served chilled, the soft, juicy red fruits and the peppery notes are a really refreshing match for these little nibbles. Um, I can't wait to make this recipe or be invited to one of your dinner parties, Eric, where you're going to make them. If you didn't get around to making the cookies, though, Gamay is a really refreshing choice um, for just cheddar on its own um, or even more decadent cheeses, which I love, like a bloomy rind camembert or triple cream brie. I've got a recipe in the archives with roasted grapes and camembert that I love going to. It's such an easy appetizer and it goes great with Gamay, too. Um, but when you're serving a variety of cheese, and I usually like to put out a few, I say don't overthink it when it comes to the pairings. Um, try to pick something that's going to match with everything. A hoppy IPA, a zesty and zingy apple or pear cider. They're going to go great with a bunch of matches. For something a little more unexpected, try Rosewood's Honey Wine. Um, this one right here. I'm a cheese lover over desserts, even though... Obviously, I love carrot cake um, and a snacking platter of cheese along with like a sipper like this is like my dream finale to a meal. Um, if you're interested in these products, we've got lots of products and options in store, of course, and on LCBO.com. We even have home delivery. We encourage you to drink responsibly. And if you go to LCBO.com, you'll find our lighter choices page. And on that page, we've got lots of lower alcohol products and some delicious mocktails, too. So check that out. So also on lcbo.com, you'll find the Thanksgiving pairing guide that Victoria has already mentioned. And you'll also find our archive of over 6,000 food and drink recipes. So if the recipes here didn't do it for you, hopefully there's something in those archives that'll work for you for Thanksgiving. And of course, that's where you can also download our autumn issue. And I think that's it for today. So thank you everyone for joining us. And we wish you all a very happy and healthy Thanksgiving. <laughs>